News Alert on the ongoing talks with nuclear North Korea. President Trump reportedly prepared to tell Kim Jong Un he must dismantle his nuclear arsenal before the United States would consider providing him any relief from crippling economic sanctions. This is Outnumbered. I'm Harris Faulkner, here today host of After the Bell on Fox Business, Melissa Francis, host of Kennedy on FBN, Kennedy, <laughs> Republican strategist and Fox News contributor, Lisa Booth. Oh, she's smiling and giggling. <laughs> and joining us in the center seat, Salem Radio nationally syndicated radio host and best-selling author, Larry Elder is in the house. And you, we say, are outnumbered. How are you feeling on this fine I'm spring I'm feeling day? good. I hope uh, I don't bring bad karma like I did the last time. Last time I was here, there was a train derailment. Remember that? I remember Ooh. We spent the whole time talking about that. So hopefully I won't bring any bad karma. Okay, let's, okay. let's speak it. And yeah. it right. happen. Praying that doesn't happen. That's I'm right. glad you're here. Right. Let's get to the news. Major new developments now in the run-up to potential talks with North Korea. The Wall Street Journal is now reporting President Trump plans to urge the rogue regime to act quickly to dismantle its nuclear arsenal. This comes after some potentially positive developments out of the North and an announcement the regime would suspend its nuclear weapons testing. The president expressing caution, though. He tweeted this over the weekend. We are a long way from conclusion on North Korea. Maybe things will work out and maybe they won't. Only time will tell. But the work I am doing now should have been done a long time ago. Retired four-star General Jack Keane defending the president's approach. Watch. Well, anybody that has any knowledge of the Kim dynasty has got to be skeptical, sure, and I know for a fact the White House certainly is that. A any thought that I've, I've, I've seen in, in the media and by some other people that the president's going to go into this thing and not be properly prepared for this is an absolute absurdity. Hmm. President Trump is slamming critics of his policy decisions on Twitter as well. Funny how all of the pundits that couldn't come close to making a deal on North Korea are now all over the place telling me how to make a deal. <laughs> Larry? <laughs> well, he has, a good, he has a good point. Uh, when he first started talking about North Korea, they were shooting off a lot of missiles, and very few people thought there'd be any kind of hope that Kim Jong-un would sit down with the, with the South. And now apparently that's happening. They're talking about denuclearization. Uh, I am very, very skeptical, as is the president, as should be the president. However, things do change. The Soviet Union collapsed. Only years before that, people were talking about how enduring it was going to be. And I remember when I was in college, I had a professor, professor from Nigeria. We talked about uh, apartheid in South Africa. And I said, how long is this going to last? He said, through my lifetime, through your lifetime, and through likely the lifetime of your kids. It fell in my lifetime. So things do happen. Yeah, you, you know, it's interesting. You and I talk all the time about how resources and energy and money can change just about any conversation. Is that a play here? Oh, absolutely. I mean, without question, I think that all of the talk of tariffs and, and uh, obviously the sanctions as well, but I think the tough talk on tariffs has put pressure on North Korea vis-a-vis -vis the other nations surrounding them. Um, I also think, you know, I, I like what General Jack Keane had to say because that has been that slam on the president and even former Governor Bill Richardson sat on the couch here with us and said that he suspected the president wasn't going to be prepared. And I think, you know, the general said that's ridiculous. It's obvious that he's preparing. I like the language um, that they need to dismantle their program. And I wonder what that means, because to me, yeah. it signals that we're not going to get hosed and we need to see something real as opposed to a pause or a stop or something verifiable. Yes, it's an excellent point because the senior administration official is telling The Wall Street Journal, Kennedy, that's where that reporting is coming from, that the U.S. will not be making substantial concessions such as lifting sanctions, so on and so forth. Um, until they move in mm -hmm. such a huge way. Yeah, and I, I think you've seen that naive optimism through at least three previous administrations where they do, you know, because North Korea comes to the table so that they think automatically they are somehow trustworthy because they want it to work mm. out so badly. They have wanted that so badly in the past. And I think anything the president can do differently in that regard uh, will leave the pen peninsula certainly better off. And of course, you know, we want a lot of things from these talks. Uh, we want denuclearization. We want oversight from international monitoring agencies. We want to see where they have been creating this fissile material and, and making sure you can shut that down. I mean, I would also like to see uh, humanitarian agencies visit some of the labor camps and help free some uh, of those people, not just the three Americans that are still detained that CEI Director well, Mike Pompeo talked to Kim Jong-un about. I would love to see their release, but at this point in time, we do have to do things differently and we cannot automatically lift sanctions on the hope that good things will shortly follow because yeah. in the past they have not. What you're saying though, enumerating some of the other things that could be
would be on the table. That That's really important and interesting too, Lisa. Well, and to Kennedy's point, I think that's why we're seeing this table setting from President Trump of sort of leaving a lot of ambiguity. Maybe this will be a good meeting. Maybe it won't. Maybe we'll cut a deal. Maybe we won't, which is so unlike the Obama administration that wanted to cut a deal with Iran. And it didn't matter what yeah. the deal was. He just wanted it for legacy purposes. And President Trump is doing the opposite of that, at least in the table setting, which is important. And I also think that a big difference in dealing with North Korea now than where we have seen with previous presidents is President Trump's threats are viewed as credible. We know that North Korea and Kim Jong-un was reaching out to Republicans in Washington, D.C., trying to figure out who is this Trump guy. And I think President Trump starting out the gate, as I've said before on this show, shooting those Tomahawk missiles to Syria, dropping the mother of all bombs in Afghanistan, and then once again following up in Syria uh, with missiles, sends a message to North Korea that I'm not playing around. And that is critical and important here heading into these negotiations. You know, Larry. And sur surrounding the uh, North Koreans with uh, American aircraft carriers has a way to put, uh, to use the expression that Colin Powell once used, has a way of opening up your nostrils. <laughs> Oh, is that what he said? That's, what he said. That's interesting, too, because it isn't just in that area which would have sent a message. Look at what we did on the China Sea off the coast of Vietnam when we brought in the USS Carl Vinson. Right. Remember that? That was about a month ago, and, and he got everybody's attention there because China mm -hmm. might have thought that they would, you know, dinosaur right. stomp through the, through the islands there. And we were like, well, wait a minute, because we're going to pull in a battleship. So it isn't just with North Korea, but, but that whole alliance. That's actually right. a really important point mm -hmm. is, is the element that China isn't they're not participating in this so far it's it's a dialogue between north korea and south korea first and then the president of the united states and, and kim jong-un china isn't a part of that discussion and that means that if there is a way of of unifying that peninsula once again and actually ending the war that has been going on since 1953 and the United States is having a major say in that, uh, China is really, rightly so, I mean, they are in timeout because they have appeased this regime for so long and allowed them like, to get to this They're still giving them energy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, very true. Oh, definitely. All right. The Sen Senate Foreign Relations Committee is set to vote on President Trump's nominee for Secretary of State Mike Pompeo later today. At this moment, it appears likely that the committee will deliver a historic snub to the man tapped to be the country's next top diplomat. Mr. Pompeo is already involved in the country's most delicate international relations earlier this month. He met secretly with North Korean dictator Kim Jong Un. And despite all that, all Democrats on the committee and Republican Senator Rand Paul say the plan to vote, they plan to vote against Pompeo. That would make 10 votes for and 11 against. Last week, ranking Democrat member on foreign relations, Senator Bob Menendez, announced his opposition to Pompeo, saying, quote, his past statements do not reflect our nation's values and are not acceptable for our nation's top diplomat. The American people deserve better. Republican Senator Tom Cotton accused Democrats of playing politics with a critical national security issue. The Democrats, especially on the Foreign Relations Committee, are, are really engaged in shameful political behavior. Fifteen of them voted for Mike Pompeo last, last year to be the director of the CIA. Most of these Democrats don't have a problem with Mike Pompeo. They are still struggling to get over the election of Donald Trump in 2016. Or frankly, they face elections this year in 2018, and they're afraid of scaring the move on org or code pink crowd and it's really shameful behavior beyond all the drama over the foreign relations committee it cannot stop pompeo from becoming the next secretary of state the full senate will still vote on the nomination and pompeo is expected to be confirmed no matter what the committee decides and larry i mean is that the point that this the, the snub is about the show of it I think so, and, and I still think they haven't gotten over the fact that Donald Trump won the election. Even the Washington Post editorialized in favor of Mike Pompeo's confirmation. You've got a couple of uh, uh, Democrats who are probably going to vote for him. Joe Manchin yeah. may, vote for, may vote for Hold him. Hold on. Uh, let me step Mike in Kennedy. with a little bit of breaking news. Joe Manchin says he will vote to confirm Mike Pompeo as Secretary of State. Um, it's like you knew that that was hanging the, in the air the, with the, 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 the dialogue. The, the ability Manchin, that I have right? is just <laughs> incredible. Good timing. Uh, so <laughs> Senator oh, yeah. Joe Manchin, Democrat <laughs> West Virginia, has released the following statement on his decision to vote and I did to not confirm, know this. <laughs> uh, the Secretary of State 
nominee Mike Pompeo. After meeting with Pompeo, discussing his foreign policy perspectives and considering his distinguished time as CIA director and his career in public service, I will vote to confirm Mike Pompeo. That is Joe Manchin of La Virginia. Larry set that up so well. <laughs> it's almost yeah. as if he, he knew we had that as a call for. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, I obviously did not know that. Um, so, so there you go. So we know about Manchin on that front. At the same time, President Trump tweeting, it's hard to believe obstructionists may vote against Mom Mike Pompeo for Secretary of State. The Dems will not approve hundreds of good people, including the ambassador to Germany. They are maxing out the time on approval process for all never happened before. Need more Republicans. Kennedy. Well, I, of course, both sides are going to try and stoke the passion as much as possible before the midterms and use every issue in every conceivable way in order to get voters excited about it. Um, I, I think that it, Rex Tillerson's time at Secretary of State was not a, a, a blinding success. And I think anyone who becomes our next chief diplomat deserves scrutiny. I'm sorry. And, and I don't have a problem with Rand Paul voicing his opposition to Mike Pompeo. I think that's fine. I think that's coming from a place of principle. Uh, but some Democrats who are just doing it for the sake of being hyper-politicized, I, I don't think that that's helpful to the process. And it also doesn't help us have a genuine and honest conversation, which is certainly required of a position like well, this. And that's the problem, because scrutiny, yes, but this political gamesmanship, no. And this is political gamesmanship for those on the left. You have someone like Senator Feinstein, who supported him for CIA mm -hmm. director, who's now opposing him for Secretary of State because she's facing a progressive left-wing challenger uh, running for Senate re-election. And then you also have someone like Heidi Heitkamp, who was the first Democrat to come out in support of Mike Pompeo yeah. for Secretary of State, because she is running in North Dakota, a state that President Trump by 36 points. So make no mistake about it, this opposition or being for him for cases like Joe Manchin and Heidi Heitkamp, this is all about politics. Well, and now, and please forgive me for having jumped on that. No, um, no, no. <laughs> but now it's 51 votes, right? So even if Rand Paul decides he wants to go no, they can do it. They can that's move right. forward on Pompeo. Well, and that, that's, right. that's huge news that's because... Right. In the event there's a tie, then you have Vice President Pence who could break the tie. But the, 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 the quarrel that the president has about slow walking his nominees is a legitimate one. You right. even have Chuck Schumer when uh, Obama was in office saying that every president deserves to have, to have his own people criticizing the Republicans for, in his view, obstructing their, their uh, nominees. So this is over 100 people, very critical positions, uh, and uh, in my opinion, the Trump Trump is uh, is perfectly legitimate uh, in, in being angry about the, the fact that his nominees are being held up. It's also really smart because uh, this leak of the meeting that happened between Mike Pompeo and Kim Jong-un happened as Mike Pompeo is being considered for Secretary of State because what it does is always already paint Mike Pompeo as the Secretary of State acting in that position. So I, I think it's really smart. I assume it was probably intentional um, and sort of gives Mike Pompeo a nice little lead up to hopefully being confirmed as Secretary of State. Yeah, you wonder if it makes those who are against him look ridiculous or if it doesn't really matter. You know, I mean, because they're going to stand up and say no, no matter what. We'll see. Mm -hmm. All right. Counselor to the President Kellyanne Conway accusing one prominent journalist of treating her with a double standard after she was asked about her husband's recent tweets. And you have got to see how it all went down. Plus, pressure is mounting on former FBI Director James Comey. The Justice Department Inspector General is now investigating whether or not he may have broken the law by releasing classified information. Mr. Comey denies that, but we'll debate it. I think all throughout this process, he has been wrong. Hello and welcome back. Pressure growing on former FBI Director James Comey from Congress, the President, and the Inspector General of the Justice Department as Mr. Comey continues promoting his tell-all book. Last week, the Justice Department released memos in which Mr. Comey detailed his private conversations with the President. Three Republican chairmen say the memos show Comey's political bias and President Trump tweeting, quote, James Comey's memos are classified. I did not declassify them. They belong to our government. Therefore, he broke the law. Additionally, he totally made up many of the things he said I said, and he is already a proven liar and leaker. Where are memos <laughs> on Clinton, Lynch, and others? Comey says he did not release any classified material, but the Justice Department's Inspector General Mike Horowitz is looking into Comey's decision to give the memos to a friend. Constitutional law professor Jonathan Turley was asked this morning if Comey did, in fact, break the law.
personal diary as so many in the media portrayed it as, uh, when we see the memos, it only re reaffirms what many of us said at the time. This is clearly FBI material covered by FBI regulations. You're not allowed just to take them and leak them to the media. And violating some of those FBI regulations, that's why one of the reasons Andrew McCabe was fired. He mm -hmm. was also fired essentially for doing the same thing that James Comey right. has admitted doing. So what do the memos say to you, Larry? Well, I'm inclined to agree with Professor Turley, who, in my opinion, he and, and uh, Dershowitz have been right from this thing from the very beginning. Uh, I don't know whether or not it's illegal. Probably is. Uh, I do know that this book that uh, Comey has been promoted hasn't helped him. A number of uh, agents who used to praise him have now said that they feel his remarks were political, they were cheap, uh, and since we have an ongoing investigation, it could compromise that. Uh, if I were President Trump, if I were giving him advice, I know he watches Fox, let it play out. I don't believe that ultimately Mueller's going to find anything at all, and if he does, it goes over to the, to the uh, Congress. Congress will then have impeachment proceedings. He won't be impeached in the unlikely event that Democrats are stupid enough to impeach him, assuming they take the House. It then goes to the Senate. There has never been a Senate who's voted to impeach, to throw out of office a president of his own party. Yes. It's not going to happen now. It didn't happen in, in Andrew Johnson. It didn't happen with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with uh, Clinton. It's not going to happen now. So hmm. Trump is not going to be thrown out of office. What they're trying to do, and doing very successfully, is throw salt in the gears of his agenda. Mm. And that's what they're doing, and that's what they will continue to do. Do your job, Mr. President. Get economy going at 4% plus, and, and the Democrats will not take control of the of the House uh, in the fall, and he'll be reelected in 2020. I think if, if in fact, this, go, this does go down the road to impeachment, I don't think it's the worst thing for the president. I think that actually helps the president. I don't think the president should talk to special counsel right. at this point, but yeah. it, it really doesn't hurt him. What happens to James Comey, though? Andrew McCabe was, was fired. Yeah. Andrew McCabe has now been referred for criminal prosecution. What happens to James Comey? I bet nothing. Mm -hmm. I think that probably he has covered himself, you know, in one way or the other. Nothing comes of this other than the fact that when you look at the memos side by side with the book, they contradict each other in yeah. a bunch of ways. I mean, when he talks about in the memos, he was comfortable, everything was fine, they had a you know relationship, and then in the book, he's talking about he's nauseous, he's a, you know, it's this horrible situation. Um, he just looks sort of cheap and like he's mm. out there trying to make money, and he's out there, you know, trying to be in the spotlight, which is not a good look for an FBI director but I don't know Harris I mean I think that that's about it yeah so it's interesting because as you were talking I thought well it's less about the book that's been damaging and more about the tour that's been damaging yes. because he yeah. has yeah. you know kind of given texture something to some things that people might not have even noticed or at least not have noticed as much. And then you got an apology and a retraction from him. Mm. Oh, I wish I hadn't put yeah. the things that I said about the president's appearance in the book because that's often uncomfortable. He's also so wishy-washy. I mean, there's yeah, so yeah. many maybes and it's possible and I don't know and I guess so. Uh, and, and he's like Hillary Clinton and that he won't stop. But my question is, where are those other memos? Because I think the president brings up a good point here. And if he wasn't political, then go ahead and show us some of the conversations you had with Democrats. Yeah. What, was, what was your re recollection of the conversation he had with Loretta Lynch after the tarmac. Well, and that's something that committee chairman um, Gowdy, Nunez, and uh, Goodlatte have all raised as well. Of where were the where were the memos with someone like Loretta Lynch, who uh, you've now had an exchange of words with, with uh, Comey saying that her, her telling him to call the investigation a matter as opposed to an investigation. Right. He had issues with that. Loretta Lynch said he did not. But look, he's really exposed himself and damaged himself in this process because what if we have found out? Now he's being probed for his handling of classified information. Mm -hmm. We know that he showed the dossier, just the salacious information to President Trump, never told him it was funded by Democrats. Uh, then that meeting was leaked. Um, so you look at all these things that have happened and also you look at the memos that have now been uh, put out there. And we know that the memos show that there wasn't obstruction of justice. If anything, President Trump was telling him that he wants to get to the bottom of all of this Russia stuff, right. that he wanted it to be investigated. So I think Comey has really damaged himself in this and also had damaged the investigation as well. And well, Lisa, I wonder about all the people at the FBI. I mean, this guy's out there. He was in charge for a long time. Larry, what do you think about well, that? Well, I mean, when, we have when thousands some, of people doing their jobs well there. Well, it must be pretty, pretty demoralizing. And when is somebody going to ask Comey? I've seen virtually every one of the interviews. No one's asked him, you 
exonerated Hillary but by finding that she had no intent to violate the Espionage Act. Intent is not an element of the act. How did you find something that isn't even required? No one's asking that question so far. Or why did you find something? Yeah, why did you find something that wasn't required? Required. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Brett Barr is going to talk to him on April 26th. He'll, 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 he'll bring it up. 6 p.m. Eastern. He'll bring so it up. That's, if he's that's watching a, outnumbered, we can ask him how he found it. That's a great question because how did they go from gross negligence to extreme carelessness? She said she lacked the intent. Intent is not a requirement of the statute. How is it that she lacked intent when it's not required? Mr. Comey. I think Brett will get to the bottom of it. I right? Do too. I can't Brett, wait. I hope you're watching. He's, he's like a, a news wait. minor <laughs> spelunking and whatnot. <laughs> Coming up, French President Emmanuel Macron. Macron. On why he believes he and President Trump share a special bond ahead of the first official state visit of the Trump presidency and the hunt for a killer after a suspected madman shoots up a Waffle House, killing four people. What police are saying now, plus... Were warning signs missed? We'll discuss in moments. Stay right here. Once he started shooting, I, I hit the ground and kind of kept an eye on him from underneath my car to make sure he wasn't going to come and try and shoot me. To alert a city on edge as police hunt for the suspect in a Waffle House restaurant shooting outside Nashville. Four people killed early Sunday morning. Police say 29 year old Travis Reinking drove to the busy restaurant and killed two people in the parking lot with a rifle before entering and continuing to open fire. Law enforcement crediting a quick thinking customer for averting more bloodshed. James Shaw Jr. wishes he could have done more. And I looked behind me and there was a gentleman um, outside on the sidewalk and then um, kind of jumped towards the bathroom and uh, the shooter or suspect um, entered. Um, he shot towards the bathroom. Um, pretty sure he grazed my arm. At least that's what they say in the hospital. I'm sorry I couldn't get to the guy any faster. Um, or we could have got him out in the, the parking lot or something like that. But I, you know, I didn't know he was going to come in there armed to the teeth like that. Wow. While there is still no clear reason why this may have happened, police say Ryan King has a history of mental illness and previous brushes with the law. In 2016, his family reportedly called emergency services to report their son believed pop star Taylor Swift was stalking him. Last summer, Ryan King had his weapons seized, including his AR-15, after he breached a security perimeter at the White House. Police say those weapons were turned over to Ryan King's father, who they say gave the guns back to his son. Meanwhile, those with any information are encouraged to call the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. We might pop up that number on the screen here. 800-TBI-FIND-FIND, 800-TBI-FIND, or the Metro National Police, uh, Nashville Police Department, area code 615-862-7744, manhunt for him. In the next hour, French President Emmanuel Macron is set to arrive in the D.C. area, and then he's headed to the White House as President Trump prepares to host his first official state visit. This evening, President Trump and the First Lady will host the French president and his wife at a rare private dinner at George Washington's Mount Vernon estate. Reports are that the two men have forged a friendship despite some strong differences. In a Fox News Sunday exclusive, the French leader told Chris Wallace why he thinks he and the president share a special bond. Look, I think we have a very special relationship because both of us are probably the maverick of the systems uh, uh, on both sides. I think President Trump's election was unexpected in your country, and probably my election was unexpected in my country. And we are not part of the classical political system. And while their rapport appears real, Macron appears to caution the president over his stances on the Iran nuclear deal, climate change, and international trade. You cannot make a trade war with your lie. I'm, very, I'm, I'm an easy guy. I'm very simple. I'm straightforward. It's too complicated. If you make war against everybody, you make trade war against China, trade war against Europe, war in Syria, war against Iran. Come on, it's not, it doesn't work. You need a lie. We are the allies. 
Kenny, he's very charming, first of all. <laughs> and, and he's the perfect sidekick for the president because you need the good guy and the bad guy and all these things. And the president's going to be the bad guy where he says, I'm, you know, tariffs, I'm going to put it. And he goes, oh, come on, my friend, come to the table. He's a perfect sidekick. Yeah, he's, and it's interesting because it's a contrast for how a lot of people tend to take on the president, which is yeah. through carpet bombing and insults. And it, it never ends never well. Works. And, and the president tries to goad people into those kind of exchanges. And Macron's actually being really smart because he's like, no, we're friends. and. You know, we were both unlikely victors. You know, Here's what we have in common, even though we have nothing in common. We're non-traditionalists in traditional political systems. And, you know, it, it's, it's very smart. And he lays out the reasons why they see eye to eye. And if, if you see eye to eye with every single thing the president says and does, I think you're lying. <laughs> I, it, I don't think yeah. he'd believe you. Yeah, I yeah. think he would. I, I, yeah. yeah. I, I don't think he would. And I think it's disingenuous. And I think it's, it's just fine to take issue with certain positions right. the president has or statements that he's made. And I don't think that's where the president has a problem. Kennedy, well, and, also, Macron has really bad ratings or, or did recently. Yeah. And just as American presidents go overseas to improve their ratings, French presidents go overseas to improve theirs as well. Interesting, mm -hmm. uh, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, Theresa May's numbers are lower than Trump's. Um, uh, Merkel numbers in Germany. Merkel are, are will be here by the end of the week. The head of next. Mexico's mm -hmm. numbers are lower. The head of, uh, of Canada, Trudeau's numbers are lower. So. Well, and to Kennedy's point, Macron has been wooing President Trump uh, in a way some other leaders have it. They had dinner at the yeah. Eiffel Tower when President Trump had visited. Very romantic. Uh, so <laughs> romantic. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we saw President Trump and him at the Bastille Day parade as well, which had yeah. a big impact on the president. And sometimes you just need a bestie in life. And maybe they yeah. also just get along on a personal level. There was a report, which I, I hope it's true, that President Trump ha or his aides had a New York Times article delivered to um, Macron that said, uh, we read it, it said, yes, Emmanuel, it's true, I love you. <laughs> about a New York Times article talking about their bromance, and we don't, I guess we don't know if President Trump himself wrote it, but it was given from the Trump team well to uh, Macron, and I hope it's true because it's hilarious. It is hilarious. You know, on a more you, serious yeah, note, though, the you, way man. that Macron has described them both as being people whom their electorate didn't think would get hired That's true. by voters, uh, and calling them both equally mavericks because of that. I mean, even though they may not be politically yoked on some of the bigger issues, um, at least the door is open because they can kind of understand how they both got there. And remember, I mean, if you, you'll recall, Macron's... Uh, opponent was more Trump-like in the run-up to this in yeah. terms of the way that she right. was doing her politics, maybe not all of the politics themselves. But it, it's interesting. He has spun this on a dime, and he right. sees the connection of, yeah, nobody thought we'd be here, dude, so here we are. Yeah. And, and I think the, the broader point is that uh, world leaders do not despise Donald Trump. They don't. They respect him. And um, a growing number. Well, they respect of, those missiles too. <laughs> and a growing number of world leaders, in my opinion, are becoming increasingly impressed with the fact that he talks the talk and walks the walk. And, and you're talking about that Bastille Day event in Harris. I mean, you were looking at this yes. beforehand. There, so, there, the president has a lot of plans for so Mr. So it's Mitchell. interesting. Um, this may come up. He's giving a briefing in the next hour, and this may come up when this happens. Or I shouldn't say he is. The press briefing with White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders that the president reportedly has has plans to have military members and cabinet secretaries and members of Congress gathered on the South Lawn for Macron's arrival. Do things differently. Why not? I mean, I, I think that's one of the things sort of rattling these institutions and doing things just for the sake that they've always been done a certain way. I don't think that's a, a good enough justification for a lot of this. And I think you're right. You may disagree with the president, but he, when he says he's going to do something, he tries to find a way to do it, perhaps that hasn't been done before. And, you know, in, in some ways it can be problematic. I don't necessarily agree with the tariffs, but in the case of North Korea, I think that is an area where other foreign leaders can say, oh, well, last word, Lisa, real quick. Well, yeah, I was going to say, and not to mention, more importantly, that France joined us in the strikes against Syria That's as well. So they've yeah. been a friend to us, They're one of our it. oldest allies, yeah. uh, military alliance going back to the Revolutionary War. So yeah. once again, France was with us. Right. Uh, so that's very important. All right, new fallout over the DNC's lawsuit accusing the Trump campaign, including with Russia, Tom Perez, who, as you know, is the head of the DNC, is on the hot seat now. And now House Intelligence Committee Chairman Devin Nunez says it was actually Democrats who colluded with Russia, by the way. We'll debate.
It's happy music welcoming you back to the couch. <laughs> Democratic National Committee Chairman Tom Perez now defending the DNC's lawsuit against the Trump campaign, Russia, WikiLeaks, and others. Why stop there? It alleges a conspiracy to interfere in the 2016 election. Here's Chairman Perez. We had people on my team at the DNC who got death threats. And you know what? When you try to do that to our team, yeah, I'm going to punch back. I'm punching back not only for my colleagues, I'm punching back for democracy. That's what we believe in as Democrats. Elections should be fair. I understand people may agree and disagree, but you know what? We're fighting for them. So sue everybody. However, fellow Democrats <laughs> don't share his enthusiasm. Democratic Senator Claire McCaskill calling the lawsuit a silly distraction. And Democratic Congresswoman Jackie Sp Spire calling it ill-conceived. Now, meantime, House Intelligence Chairman Devin Nunes says Democrats should look in the mirror if they want to talk about foreign interference in the 2016 election. We know who colluded with Russians. They don't want to admit that they colluded with Russians. But they hired Fusion. G they hired a law firm that hired Fusion GPS that hired a British spy that went and colluded with Russians. So I don't understand why they just didn't open up a lawsuit against themselves. They should name themselves and sue themselves so that they can get to the bottom of what do they have on their servers? Uh, why didn't they give those servers to the FBI? Well, there are so many parties named in that lawsuit. We still haven't gotten to the bottom of it. They might have done that. <laughs> President, Trump's, <laughs> <it's true. laughs> President Trump suggesting Democrats could be forced to hand over material like the DNC servers in Hillary Clinton's deleted emails in a countersuit over that election. Uh, I think this is silly. I mean, have we really gotten to the point we are in active investigations, not only with special counsel, but also in Congress? So is the DNC saying that all of those democratic mechanisms have failed and now the only way to resolve all of this is through the courts? I think they are increasingly pessimistic that Mueller is going to come up with something. And this is a way of keeping it alive. It's also a way of fundraising. And I found it interesting that uh, Senator Claire McCaskill called it a silly distraction. This is a woman who ran when she ran for Senate, said, and I'm quoting, George W. Bush let people die on rooftops in New Orleans because they were poor and they were black, end mm -hmm. of quote. Tim Rustard had her on. He was so upset about it, he asked her about it. And ultimately, she backed up and said, I probably shouldn't have said it. So these guys do this. What they do is yell, scream, pound, play race card, anything they can to distract from what's going on. And what's going on here is that President Trump has turned the economy around. We're at 4%. He's, he's fulfilling his agenda. They need to have some sort of argument with their argument. Larry, would you forgive me, please? We have to break in for breaking news right now. We want to go to Nashville, Tennessee. Police are talking about uh, trying to catch the Waffle House uh, shooter. Remember, four people killed. And so now they're giving us an update. Let's watch. Laptop case wound up at I-24 and Old Hickory Boulevard prior to the shooting or after the shooting. Nevertheless, when the search is completed of this immediate area, and it's being done very carefully by grids, when the search is, conduct, or is completed here, it will be extended beyond I-24 and Old Hickory Boulevard. Uh, if Ryan King is still in the woods, uh, he's been there now for more than 24 hours, and at some point he's going to have to uh, try to come out for food or water. So the law enforcement presence is continuing significantly. Uh, we would urge citizens not just in this area, but also uh, down to the Rutherford County line and beyond the uh, I-24 Old Hickory Boulevard area, west of I-24 and Old Hickory Boulevard, to also be vigilant. Uh, we've talked to Lamar Advertising today, and very soon electronic billboards will be going up throughout the region with Ryan King's photograph urging persons to call in if they see him. Uh, questions? Did he steal a car? Do you believe that he may be getting help right now, or do you think he's still on foot? There have been no confirmed sightings of him, so we don't know where he is. If he, It is possible that he has left the area. We just don't know. Uh, he did steal a car last week. Uh, we have been in contact with the Brentwood Police Department in Williamson County. It is our understanding that last Tuesday he drove his pickup truck to uh, near a BMW dealership in Brentwood, parked it at a storage facility, walked to the BMW dealership, inquired about purchasing a BMW. Uh, when the sales associate asked for his identification, he refused to give it, but had 
the fob, the key fob for a BMW automobile and stole the car from the dealership. Brentwood police reports that they found the vehicle as he was driving it and engaged in a pursuit during rush hour. Uh, because of all of the vehicles on the road at that time and the fact that this vehicle had GPS capability and could be tracked, uh, the pursuit was discontinued by the Brentwood Police Department and later that evening the vehicle was recovered from Ryan King's apartment complex. But I would hasten to add that they had no idea who the man was. He wouldn't give any identification. Uh, there was no clue whatsoever of his name, but due to the GPS tracking, the vehicle that BMW was recovered on Tuesday from that apartment complex. He said he got the fob. He had the fob from the dealership. They gave it to him and then they asked him. I would defer to the Brentwood Police Department on the specifics or the BMW dealership. But that car had nothing to do with the shooting that was recovered daily. That's correct. He stole the car on Tuesday and due to the GPS capability was recovered he, on Tuesday. Did he jump out of the car and just leave it there or, should he, or was he arrested there on the site? When they recovered from it. No, the vehicle was recovered from his apartment complex due to the GPS capability. There was no one in it. He was not arrested. The but, police department nor the dealership knew who he was. But the car he took to the Waffle House, that was his, that was his, that was his the pickup truck. Yeah. You are correct. And there's no connection between the BMW and the dealership. There's no reason to believe that he may have been planning something maybe on Tuesday to do something similar. Well, uh, that remains to be seen. Uh, we don't know what his plan was. Uh, certainly, uh, he had a pickup truck. Certainly, he had possession of this BMW car. What his intention uh, for taking the BMW car remains to be seen. Did you ever refer to yourself? Yeah. During the investigation and the search of the apartment on yesterday, the Metro Police Department recovered the fob, the key fob to the BMW. He had referred to himself as a sovereign citizen. And we knew that the car was recovered from that apartment complex. Did anyone dust the, the BMW for fingerprints that may have led police then to, to Travis Reinking? Uh, I would defer to the Brentwood Police Department. The car theft investigation is taking place in another county, in another jurisdiction. He referred to himself as a sovereign citizen before. Shots fired at the Burnett Chapel. What, what was that? Can you tell us more information about that? Uh, I have seen a report of shots. Uh, that has nothing whatsoever to do with the search for Ryan King. Uh, I've been informed that there is a gun range uh, in that area, in that vicinity, perhaps what uh, was heard was coming from a gun range or maybe a hunter or something to that effect, but it has nothing to do with Travis Reinkamp. Uh, my understanding is that he has. Uh, I personally do not. Uh, at this America. It's a laptop case, not a laptop. So what else was in it? Can you talk about? It was empty. It was empty except for that. Camera. It did have a handwritten identification card with the name Travis Ryan King on that card. Are you and aware? If you could clarify, the father had said the acknowledgement was police in Illinois, and I understand this is a different jurisdiction. But the father had said that and had told investigators in Illinois they had an understanding that he wasn't going to give the weapons back to his son. I am not aware of any of that. Should he have done, should, you know, is that legal what he did? Was Ryan King able to have weapons in Tennessee? As we discussed uh, yesterday, as Chief Anderson said, who, by the way, is a lawyer, he is unfamiliar with the statutes in Illinois, uh, as am I. Uh, as to the legality of the transference back to the son, I don't know uh, what uh, the issues uh, could be in Illinois. Uh, it is not illegal in Tennessee. Uh, to possess long guns, uh, legal long guns. Uh, so I do not, uh, I, I guess I would defer to Illinois and what their statutes are and their interpretation of the law. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Well, uh, from the totality of the circumstances, from the issue at the White House 
And from what we hear in Illinois, uh, he shows uh, signs of significant instability. Uh, yesterday, the police department recovered two long guns from the apartment. We also obviously have the AR-15. Uh, there was a fourth gun, a handgun, that is unaccounted for. Uh, he could well be in possession of that handgun. So uh, we have a man with, uh, who has exhibited significant instability. Uh, we are concerned for, uh, for the citizenry, not just here, but anywhere else he may go. And that's why you are seeing the significant law enforcement resources dedicated to this, uh, not just from this police department, but the, our federal partners as well. Are you aware if Brian King was ever gun? diagnosed with a mental illness? Uh, I personally am not. Sir, how does it, if, if indeed his father or him, say that they claim to be members of the sovereign citizen group, how does that either hurt, complicate, or has no impact on your investigation if you do that? Uh, I don't have anything to say about that. I don't know anything about the sovereign citizen issue. So, Don, I guess are you saying that the, the reports of the mental health instability, the issues, does that You need to start again, Sheila. I didn't hear the first so, part. Are, so, I guess you're saying that, you know, these reports of his mental health issues um, give the police or, like, a more sense of urgency because of that? Well, uh, look, the crime he committed a quadruple murder. There's nothing more. Urgent. So we have been watching the authorities in the metro area of Nashville. You see on your screen there to the left, this is Antioch, Tennessee, and this is the latest briefing now from authorities who are on a manhunt for 29-year-old Travis Reinking after he killed two people in a parking lot outside a Waffle House uh, yesterday morning and then opened fire inside the restaurant as well. Four people dead in total. They are looking for him. A couple of new information nuggets that we found. They came across through some help from a citizen a laptop case that had a handwritten ID card on it. They're tracking that down. They're, they're working that part of the case. Uh, they say he stole a car last week. They're trying to shore up how he got a key fob for certain types of vehicle and they're working that end of it as far as transportation. Um, but he also remains on Tennessee's Bureau of Investigation's top 10 most wanted list. This is a full-fledged manhunt with full support that they say they need from the public. Uh, there have been no sightings, so this is why they need the public's mm -hmm. help. Since 8.30 yesterday morning, we know potentially this is a killer. And from what the authorities were just saying, he could have other weapons. We don't know that. So we're watching for the latest from Nashville, Tennessee. As we get more, uh, we, of course, will bring it to you. Let's get back quickly, if we can, to our political discussion about the DNC. And I think you were talking about whether or not they are on the defensive right now. I remember when uh, Perez was uh, trying to get the job away from Keith Ellison, the DNC job. And I couldn't figure out which one I wanted to win because I think they're both bad for the party. Angry, uh, constantly attacking Republicans, constantly calling them uh, calling them racist so I, I'm 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 pleased with uh, with Perez I think it's a ridiculous lawsuit uh, when you have Jackie Spear from California who's yeah. left you can get uh, uh, calling it ridiculous it's probably pretty ridiculous well it also goes to show you and, and I think this is a really important point that you touch on and and go ahead and take this up when when you are launching lawsuits in the middle of all these investigations isn't it basically signaling to the world that you've run out of ideas well, exactly, because look at what's happened with the left, because you you started out with collusion and then we find out that Hillary Clinton and the DNC, the Democrats, were behind the dossier. And then it was obstruction of justice. Now, Comey's memos have come out and shown us that President Trump actually wanted the investigation to take place, wants to get to the bottom of these allegations. And now they're on to, you know, Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen. So we've seen the sequence of where this has gone from the left. And I think what this does is underscore the point that for the left, all along, this has been about nailing the president. This is about undermining the president. And it's been political from the beginning. And I think that this actually hurts the left because it underscores that very it would point. Be really entertaining though to see it come back and bite them in the rear end because as many <laughs> lawyers have pointed out when you file a lawsuit it gives the other side the right to demand documents and disclosure from you yeah so and, they could yeah, finally yeah. go back and, 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 and ask exactly. for it and, and what could right. they what could they seek <laughs> Well, uh, what all kinds of what, things. What, what, I mean, what, they're, they're, what they're seeking is a reason why we lost this election. Yeah. And what I find fascinating is you, you're talking about these Russian bots to put things uh, in Facebook. You get up in the morning, you've been bombarded by left-wing news, uh, CNN, MSNBC, CNN, everything. You read on Facebook something about uh, anti-thing about Hillary. I will vote for Trump. I will vote for Trump. I, <laughs> really? They should sue really? her for not going to Wisconsin. <laughs> I all right, will vote we're for Trump. I mean, honestly. Stay still. We'll be right back. <laughs>